uh, particular, uh, in addition, meat and perishables, which are some of our largest exports. This has meant that uh, we don't know what's going to happen to these. Uh, import hubs are in a limbo, and of course, container ships are not available. Um, so in some ways, at ports, we just are finding a lot of perishables sort of languishing. Um, there are about 140 million farm households. Uh, so the scale of what could transpire if we don't... Uh, uh, sort of put in place measures that allow farmers freedom to sell, uh, not just farmers, but also livestock owners, etc. Uh, we could be staring sort of at a prolonged and uh, protracted disaster. Um, lastly, uh, you know, sort of one uh, big thought as far as agriculture, it really is an aggregation of many, many different sub trades, right? So we're thinking about transport, testing labs, packaging industries, all of it, which are linked to the uh, agricultural uh, trades. Um, industry, uh, one of the huge things in India is that uh, manufacturing in particular is made up of very, very small enterprises, uh, sort of micro, small, medium enterprises. Uh, they are facing a deep cash flow crisis because there are no orders. Uh, their operations are either curtailed or their shutters are down while they, are, uh, they have to pay employees. Uh, particularly with the government asking that they must continue to pay, uh, to pay employees and of course taxes and utilities and things like that. Uh, MSMEs themselves in India uh, employ about 110 million people. And lastly, services. So India also did this interesting thing where it uh, skipped over manufacturing and went straight to sort of developing its services or tertiary industry. Um, and because one of its largest exports is uh, business and professional services, uh, a lot of this has come to a complete standstill. Um, you know, overall, my sense is that uh, uh, we've erected very, very strong tra trade barriers in the past or part, uh, uh, participated in them. Uh, and now that's coming back to sort of haunt us, given that other countries are going to start erecting uh, further barriers as well. Um, increased uh, sort of protectionism uh, in Asia is likely to sort of have um, uh, downstream effects on India, if you, if you will. Uh, the one shining light is potentially the medical and pharmaceutical industry. But of course, we have to wait for recovery to, uh, for at least uh, uh, to figure out the way out of lockdown before that conversation can emerge. What about Anita? How is it like in Sri Lanka? Um, thanks, Philippa. So I would say that COVID-19 has hit trade in Sri Lanka quite hard as, as it has the rest of the region. Um, I mean, to start with, uh, in terms of Sri Lanka, in trade in Sri Lanka, we have um, significant barriers to trade, both in terms of tariff and non-tariff barriers. So um, while we were seeing a slow but at least consistent increase in our exports and at least conversations moving towards diversification and general efforts to promote trade. Um, this has probably brought all of it to a standstill. Um, for instance, the Export Development Board has uh, downgraded our export target for the year by 42%, um, which is indicative of the hit um, that and the downturn that we expect to see in exports. Um, when we look at our export destination, the US is our biggest market, followed by the UK, India, Germany, Italy. Um, all of these countries have hard um, by uh, the pandemic, and this will, of course, affect demand and our ability to recover. Um, and coupling this with the global slowdown in trade that we are seeing, especially in Asia, I think the World Bank has estimated that the region will see um, the worst sort of economic conditions, the kind of which we haven't seen in about 40 years, um, which is quite significant. Um, and the Sri Lankan economy itself is expected to contract by 5%, um, which will hit businesses quite hard. Um, Coupling the fact that global disruptions in trade have brought our exports, have affected our exports quite badly, uh, the country has introduced um, a series of import restrictions. Um, it was kind of phased in first um, in, 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 uh, with an attempt to defend the currency. It started off with uh, uh, imp uh, import restrictions on luxury goods, um, cars, etc. And then the list expanded quite dramatically. And now um, it's about 70 bits. Um, and the fear is that in uh, while maybe this measure is something the government took right now, it's possibly dangerous in that it could continue. It is often far easier to put in the restriction than it is to remove the restriction. 
um, which is something I think we can all sympathize with. Um, so that is a point of concern. Um, on the flip side, like Vaughan also mentioned, um, Sri Lanka has removed tariffs on medical products. Um, and in the most case, medical grade products in the country are generally tariff exempt. Um, however, on average, our tariffs are high. So I would say when you look um, at trade in Sri Lanka, we're starting from a slightly rocky position where high tariffs and a general protectionist culture didn't position us well. Um, and the hit that we're going to take in the context of COVID is simply going to exacerbate the problem, possibly give fuel to um, uh, protectionist measures. Uh, we can see a rise in that sort of rhetoric, which has the danger to influence policy in the coming months. Yeah. Great. Um, Philippa, what's you. the situation in Indonesia? Um, sure. I'd like to share my screen to show you how it is in Indonesia and to a larger extent to the um, Asian region and also globally as well. Um, so let me just share this website out of the International Trade Center. Um, they are monitoring all of the recent trade um, policy changes um, re relating all to COVID-19. So they have temporary export measures. And as people have mentioned, we are seeing a huge increase in export measures everywhere, including Indonesia. And these are mostly on um, medical products. So export re restrictions on medical supplies, masks, etc. But also to a large extent, we're also seeing um, countries um, putting up export restrictions on agriculture goods. So um, I think Vietnam has um, put an, a cap at, on their rice exports. Um, and also, as uh, Bubana mentioned, a lot of the export restrictions are more um, naturally from the reduction in mobility. Um, and Indonesia has been on the receiving end of it. Um, we're approaching Ramadan season um, starting tomorrow. So usually people break fast with uh, um, beef, really good, delicious beef dinner and also sweets. Um, and we are, um, we import our sugar from India as well. Um, and, but now the, in, the sugar import has been delayed because of the port lockdown and the mobility lockdown in India. So now in Indonesia, we're seeing it in the grocery stores that we don't really have sugar. And if there are sugar, it's really expensive. Now it's at, I think, a dollar, one dollar and two cents, something around that area per kilo. So it's really putting a, a, a um, putting disadvantage to uh, people in the community. Uh, but as well, we have, um, for the case, similar to the case of India and Sri Lanka, we have also have temporary import measures that are uh, more liberal thing in nature. So in India, we, uh, sorry, in Indonesia, we've removed uh, our licensing requirements for onion and garlic specifically. Uh, we've noticed a shortage in those two commodities. And it was done through a non-automatic licensing system requirements, which has proven to be very ineffective and causing delays and causing really high prices. So early this year, we've decided to um, temporarily relieve the certifications and also that of uh, medical supplies, masks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So similar to India, Sri Lanka, and uh, I guess everywhere else in the world, Indonesia is also seeing both sides of the coin, um, both increasing restrictions on exports, but also um, liberalizing imports. Um, That's really yeah. interesting, Philippa. Uh, in India, we're finding sort of a little bit of the opposite in that, um, yes, imports of medical supplies and things that seem, you know, sort of egregiously necessary right now, there is some amount of liberalization, but the old uh, philosophy of import substitution and of export promotion is sort of rising its, uh, raising its ugly head all over again. Mm -hmm. So two or three things that have happened, the Indian government has this neat little tool in its kitty called the Essential Commodities Act. And that clamps down. And I was surprised to mention, uh, to hear you mention onions. Every year we have, uh, you know, sort of, uh, brouhaha in India around onions uh, <laughs> and the Essential Commodities Act is the tool that is used to say no exports of onions or no, um, you know, sort of imports of X, Y, and Z. In the case of sugar, it's really interesting. I'm hoping uh, our sugar farmers, uh, who also happen to be one of the most sort of mollycoddled lobbies in India, um, are clamoring to open it up 
precisely because the demand from other countries is through the roof. So hopefully there's some uh, sort of balancing act that happens in the world. Um, Philippa, sort of, I want to um, come back to you with a question. I mean, in the context of what looks like a global recession, right? Why is trade the answer? That's a very interesting question, a very good uh, question that everyone is asking right now. Um, well, to answer that, I think there are two main points of looking at why trade is really important. First one is in the short term, and that's for because we're in survival mode right now. We need, we are realizing that we need um, imports from other countries, and we likewise we also need to export to other countries to keep our health sector going, to keep our food security going. Um, and the protectionist policies will only add unpredictable shocks to the current shocks that we're already facing right now. The COVID shock is already enough to, um, to put a risk at economic growth. As you mentioned, all of us are experiencing a contraction in the economy. So adding a layer of protectionist policies on top of that will just add an unimaginable shock to it. Um, and so right now, the short term is because we need trade to manage the pandemic. Um, but also on the longer term, we also need trade for economic recovery. Um, coming back to the economic uh, decline, uh, the economic recession that we're seeing, and also mass unemployment in Indonesia, we're seeing, I think, about 3 million people now losing their jobs and losing their businesses. Um, and also just the poverty rate, which will jump up through the roof. Um, we will definitely need to engage in trade and engage in global value chain to speed up the economic recovery after COVID-19 um, if we want to. Um, well, things will not really go back to normal, but just to get us going into the economic recovery mode as well. Um, the World Bank early this year launched uh, the report Trading for Development, which argues really the essential point that trade is good for developing countries. Um, they have some interesting calculations there um, that a 1% increase in the global value chain participation. So if countries are participating in the global value chain and trading will uh, boost per capita income by more than 1%. And that is needed more than ever now. Um, so those are the two main things that I think about. No, that's great. Uh, if I may quickly share uh, my screen, I wanted to draw everybody's attention to uh, the trade barrier index that was released by Philip Thompson and uh, our friends at the Americans uh, for Taxpayer Reform. Um, uh, screen share, okay. Yeah. There we go. Um, I just wanted to flag that Asia has some of the worst trade barriers already in place, right? We're not doing that well by world standards. We're keeping company with Eastern Europe and Middle East and North Africa um, mm -hmm. compared to, uh, and pretty much across the board, but in particular on tariffs, services, and facilitation. Uh, so there already was a pre-existing case, if you will, uh, um, uh, that we need to do better by the world on reducing our trade barriers. There's sort of yet one more, um, uh, and your point from the World Bank study, uh, came to mind because the correlations with a number of the other indices that just serve as a gentle reminder, right? Uh, economic freedom, human development, press freedom, competitiveness, doing business, corruption, uh, and of mm. course, prosperity, uh, not least of all. Uh, the freer our trade is, the more likely that we are uh, to do well on all of the others. I'll stop uh, sharing my screen uh, now. Um, Actually, Buana, if I could bring the conversation back to you, um, simply because sanitary and phytosanitary barriers are likely to become more significant in the context of COVID. Um, could you shed some light on that for us? Sure. Um, I think this has been something that's been bothering me for quite a while. Uh, and it's a really nice, fancy way of, you know, sort of saying that um, all kinds of scientific standards that will get in the way of free trade. Uh, and this becomes very, very difficult, uh, particularly for developing countries, because of multiple reasons. One is that the standard variations are so high. Uh, it's unfair to expect, in a way, almost that uh, the kinds of standards and infrastructure that you have in, say, Western democracies, you, know, you should see from a country like India, right? So uh, 
in itself, there is a um, sort of unfairness that's built in. But along with that, just the kind of impact that it has on prices, on uh, availability, on diversity of consumption, on allowing for small players to rise rather than uh, uh, allowing sort of existing large players in the market, right? All of those things get compounded when you have a complex um, sanitary and phytosanitary uh, standards framework around the world. Uh, what, what might these include? These might include everything from residue on agricultural products. Right, so pesticide free or herbicide free, etc., or organic certification that's the new thing uh, on the block, or GM and GM related uh, marking that's necessary, or more recently, now in the case of uh, um, uh, you know, COVID 19, we don't know what kind of expectations are going to be set up uh, in different countries around uh, precautionary measures around touching, right. We know that it's, uh, the surface spread of COVID is high. So I'm worried that this is a great, neat little opportunity to erect the kind of barriers that we don't want to see. Um, what, uh, it, I, I've been thinking a little bit about what might uh, the answers to these kind of uh, uh, troubles be, right? What you want to do, and I think that COVID also shows us some examples of, uh, uh, of answers. Uh, one thing that's happened around the world is that governments have accepted each other's standards, uh, what's called equivalence in the World uh, Trade uh, Organization nego negotiation balance that uh, say, for example, US FDA has cleared something that India says, okay, no problem, we will accept, accept it. Uh, you can either get cleared by our uh, standards or by theirs. And so, you know, there's a reciprocity that's built in. I think that's a reasonable and useful way to go, uh, though I think it's insufficient. You want to expand it also to allow private standard setting organizations to come up. It'll just make it that much easier. It'll just make it that much uh, more fair, uh, as well as diverse in terms of uh, uh, data and information. Um, so that's sort of been on my mind a lot. Uh, I, I don't think there are, you know, sort of clear and uh, precise answers that do away with it or, uh, you know, sort of replace all of the, the existing standards that will take a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the moment, we, the least we can do is at least ask for uh, equivalence or, uh, you know, sort of uh, focusing on outcomes and talks and contracts, as well as third party certification and accreditation. Um, uh, that's very interesting, Bhuvana. I think your point about SPS, uh, the Sato, um, sanitary, phytosanitary thing, uh, it just reminds me of the broader non-tariff measures that, as you mentioned, um, is a huge thing in, um, around Asia as well. So my question, my next question would be to Anita then. Um, we're seeing in the COVID, we're also seeing increased um, protectionist narratives. So how do you think, can we counter those protectionist narratives and make sure that these trade restrictions that we have right now does not continue later after the COVID-19 period? Thanks, Philippa. Um, I would say that at this point, the most powerful tools at our disposal to counter this sort of rather dangerous protectionist narratives are, are facts and history combined with really good protections. Um, in the case of Sri Lanka, we gave protectionism a try. Um, closed the economy, uh, did not end well. Um, we uh, finally opened our economy in 77. And at, at that point, what we had was an economy that was completely crippled. And with it came the accompanying humanitarian ills. Um, it's difficult to make a case for something that you know results in something like acute malnutrition in young children. Um, and I think we have those facts um, and figures at our disposal, and those are things that we can utilize um, in a much greater, more effectively, I believe. Um, the, the narrative that is presented for protectionism is often focused on, we want to uplift our local economy, we want to protect our local producers, um, but the sort of impact it has, apart from the fact that that doesn't actually help your local producers, mm -hmm. apart from that economic argument, what, what I feel isn't often communicated is the impact it has on everyday people, the impact it has on a single family and their ability to purchase goods, their ability to make sure that children have access to sufficient nutrition three times a day um, and that the elderly have access to sufficient nutrition three times a day. Um, and uh, I feel like that, the, that aspect of communication is something that we really need to focus on in the coming uh, months, I would say, because at this 
point in time, governments are, are under a lot of pressure to take decisive action, to do something right now, make a decision tomorrow to magically fix this problem. And as we're seeing across the world, governments are increasingly leaning towards restrictions on trade. Um, and while, for example, some, uh, like for example, mobility restrictions, closing down airports in the context of a pandemic makes sense right now. Um, but we should be more uh, sort of wary, I would say, of things like the import restrictions that we're seeing rolled around or rolled across the country. Because um, once an import restriction list is in place and is in a country's legal system, it is very difficult to get it out because you have given your lobbyists something uh, they have been waiting for for a long time. You have given your local protectionist uh, large companies that we, have, that we see across the country, across the region as well, uh, what they have been waiting for. Now you have to take it, which is far easier said than done. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that we have to, um, with, in countering these protectionist narratives, it is a, it is a case of bringing the economic argument out because we do have the facts and rationale on our side. Um, we also have, I mean, I think uh, by that Buana Shad um, just said it all. It, it, we have conclusive evidence that when you have freer trade, I mean, you give people the choice and freedom to trade, you see immediate increases in human well being on multiple indexes. Um, and I think communication of that because it is sometimes difficult to explain to let, let's be real it has to be politicians explaining to their water bases right and that is their interest at this point the election coming up etc you have to give them an argument that will compel their water base to be like yep yeah, i'm going to vote for you because i like that policy that and the argument that would compel a water base is that you your family personally and yourself are going to be benefited and this is how you're going to be benefited by this um, very tangible uh, uh, examples of what it is. Um, and I think in countries where we have had uh, a sort of given protectionism a try, you have an arsenal of stories um, and histories that you can bring out as proof and evidence and reminders mm -hmm. um, as to why maybe this is not the best idea and why we should be very cautious um, in this kind of uh, context. Um, I think I need to wrap up, so I will leave it at that. <laughs> No, that I think, yeah, I mean, you, you made really good points about just how we communicate our economic argument. Um, I guess as a follow up question to that, then, um, what do you think now happens with all of the regional trade agreements in Asia that we have right now? How does it play a role now or perhaps later as well to help counter those protectionist narratives? Um, so South Asia remains to be one of the world's least integrated regions. Um, the World Bank estimates that interregional trade accounts for 50% of total trade in East Asia, but only 5% of South Asia's total trade. Um, so although as a region, we have a large share of world GDP, we don't trade effectively and efficiently with each other, which is a shame. Um, and definitely free trade agreements are one way to counter this and provide a solution to this. Um, in Sri Lanka's experience, free trade agreements are notoriously difficult to bring about. Um, we signed our first agreement in 10 years in 2018. Um, it took a decade to get one going. Um, and when once the agreement was signed, it faced, I mean, this is 2020 and people are still shouting about it. Um, after the agreement was put into place, there was a presidential a commission that inquired into the free trade agreement and whether it was beneficial, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I would say that uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective, um, free trade agreements definitely, yes, they do make sense, but possibly a way to bring about wide ranging, uh, a greater impact with possibly less opposition would be to work on reducing your tariffs as well. Um, I don't think we should focus only on free trade agreements. We should keep both eggs in the basket um, and tackle both topics at the same time um, so that we have explicit agreements within the region to trade, but we also make sure that those that in focusing on free trade agreements don't have general tariffs um, increasing at the same time. Um, I think that the potential in this region, once if we have, if we see greater integration um, would be immense. And I think it would also play a large role towards recovery, um, especially post COVID. Um, that being said, free trade agreements, like I, it, it takes a lot of time to get one going. 
So it, I don't <laughs> see it reasonably happening over the next few months that South Asia gets together and signs a whole bunch of trade agreements and strengthens <laughs> the existing ones as much as we would like to see that. So I would say that's a long game that we should be playing and we should be definitely focusing on. Um, and in the short term, we should be thinking about simply simp uh, removing as many general trade barriers as we can. Anita, if I may quickly, just sort of uh, one thought that came to my mind as you were making these uh, comments is it's uh, all of this hinges on this notion of reciprocity, right? What am I getting for what are the concessions that you're offering? And we constantly get stuck in that game, even though I think reasonably it was settled a long time ago that unilateral free trade is probably a damn good idea, right? Mm -hmm. um, so just for us to also, as we're thinking about stories, uh, but also as we are thinking about the fight, how do we start to convince our people that forget what they do, let's do what's right by our people. Let's think of, uh, you know, sort of ways to uh, sort of free our borders in that sense, right? It's so just a thought that came to my mind as you were speaking about. For sure, I, I agree. Um, and, and it's such shift in perspective. Like you said, the idea that like when we trade with this country, are they getting more than we are getting? Um, and shall we compare um, and, and combine with the general uh, issues and protectionist myths that immediately sure. come out of, of the shadow? Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, I think, Philippa, I wanted uh, to ask you a question. Um, which is really around, you know, sort of what is uh, SIPs doing to respond to some of these protectionist trends? Is there uh, a way that you can sort of leverage the situation to push for uh, increasingly open trade, something that you're doing at SIPs? Yeah, I think uh, to answer your question, I think now is a really good time to be a think tank and to play that role of a think tank to influence uh, policy making. This is the, uh, the momentum, like, you know, as what people say with every crisis, there comes an opportunity. Um, and at CHIPS, for example, what we've been doing so far is we've been uh, working extra hard on publishing rapid policy briefs. We're doing weekly webinars. We're also involved in meetings directly with the task force that is. Um, managing the crisis, um, we're doing press releases, engaging with the media and doing all of that, um, all in all to put up an argument to liberalize trade, to especially in food and agriculture, but more generally also um, to add a free market perspective on the policies that are happening right now in the country. Um, so in our messages, we also use that not only to address the current COVID situation, but also to use this to hopefully leverage the momentum for a more permanent trade liberalization reform. Um, we're seeing some of the import uh, liberalization that happened with onion and garlic that I mentioned. We're putting the argument to say, look, it's unnecessary to begin with. So why don't we just remove that not only temporarily, but also more permanently. So those are some of the activities that we're, we've been doing so far. And I would like to also hear um, what, your think tanks are doing as well in your country. If Bhuvana, you might want to share first. Sure. Um, I think what we are doing is taking a slightly different track. Uh, we're focusing on doing fewer things. We, uh, like I said, we're just wading into trade uh, over the last year or so. So it's taken us some time to get up to spec on you know the conversations and the uh, arguments around it. Um, what we are uh, focusing on is sort of what are the restrictions domestically that are preventing even us getting to borders, right? So particularly in agriculture, we've been seeing that uh, uh, farmers in India have no freedom to sell. Um, the, the, their go-to-market, you have to go to a government uh, licensed market. You have to sell via uh, commissioned and licensed agents and, you know, so on and so forth. So the idea of them being able to in, uh, indulge in free trade uh, is really, really sort of many leaps uh, away. So I think we're doubling down on that and we're hoping that that serves as an illustration that if uh, it makes sense to you that you should lower down uh, barriers within, uh, within the country, then it should also make sense to you that we should lower down the uh, barriers at our borders. So sort of making that uh, argument, um, we're doing this in two or three different ways. One is, of course, um, individual consultations. We find that uh, particularly in the case of agriculture and uh, related, uh, there are very strong farmer political leaders who are traditionally on the other side of the discussion table. 
but sort of bringing them uh, onto uh, the negotiating table and saying, look, let's think about what's good for a farmer, not just what's good for the, uh, you know, sort of farmer body as a whole, but for individual farmers, how can we make that happen? I think that's been our big push. Uh, is to encourage those kinds of individual conversations. Um, in light of COVID, there's one particular thing that we're championing a lot, which is um, end barriers to entering cities, particularly to port cities, reduce you know, sort of the cost of access to getting there. Um, and this is really, really hard in India, particularly because of district level lockdowns. So that's something that we're uh, working on. Uh, that being said, I think we're taking a more patient view, which is to say that um, there are lots of organizations doing great immediate response work. We're starting to gear up for sort of the long, medium to longer term uh, intervention in this space. That's very Anita? interesting. Oh, Anita. So um, I think Advo while Advocata is realigning most of our work to suit uh, this sort of new normal that we have, one project that I would like to highlight is oral history project that we're launching. Um, hopefully we'll see it launch towards the end of this week, early next week, um, soon, uh, fingers crossed. Um, is, so it's a project which documents what life was like under uh, a closed economy. Um, so we've got some very um, stories and conversations, both from people who just sort of lived through it and had to stand in the queues and uh, wait to get milk powder for their children do the sort of black market dealings because that was the only way you could get something that essential. Um, and also people who were instrumental in opening the economy up. So we have the finance minister at that time. Um, and I think that, so the, the idea is that we'll roll out these oral histories and bring it out because right now we're seeing some interesting conversation. Definitely there's a lot of protectionist narrative and oh, grow potatoes in your balcony. going um, to work. Um, but, uh, we are also seeing um, people being like people like my age. Um, I did. I was not born during the during uh, the closed economy, so I have no recollection of this. But I have heard my parents' stories, um, and people my age being like, "Oh, you know, we had to example when curfew was lifted, we had to all stand in." lines to get into the supermarket, social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. And I have never ever had to wait three hours to buy groceries. Um, that's not something I even, even thought be a thing. Um, and I think people I age are drawing these parallels to the closed economy and being like, wow, this is terrible. I like being able to get my groceries immediately. Um, so I think that is, uh, we will be launching this oral history project um, and coupling it with um, a decent amount of communications to get the message across. Great. I think that's a great note to open it up uh, to our participants. Uh, please feel free to, you know, just turn on your uh, uh, mics as well as your cameras uh, and either direct questions to any of us or to each other for an open conversation. Um, we'd love to hear, uh, you know, sort of more uh, thoughts on this. Muvana, there's one question uh, in the chat box um, that would be very interesting to look at. Um, I don't know if Dennis, yes, do it. Yeah, if you want to. Dennis, Joe. Uh, open your mic and uh, ask the question out loud. Or if not, I can also um, read it out loud to Bhuvana and maybe Bhuvana hello. can help answer the question. Oh, there you are. Yes, hello. Yeah, uh, I'll be glad to uh, open the question now. Uh, ask again. Dennis, so, would you so speak up a little bit? Hello, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes. yes. All right, okay. So, so my concern over here is like, uh, so we, we advocate for free trade, liberating trade in South, uh, in, in India as well. Yes, that's great. So, uh, but uh, isn't certain, certain administrations as such taking advantage over uh, such a free trade policy uh, that we uh, are advocating in Asia? So being the best example, and again, I don't mean to um, you know, offend anyone here, uh, if ever. Uh, so in this period of uncertainty, Shouldn't we be worried about huge investments coming from Chinese government-run companies? That's what government-run companies that I'm concerned about. Even the Central Bank of China, which is the People's Bank of China. So recently, as we, uh, as, as some of uh, like uh, I am an Indian, uh, so uh, it, uh, one of the major banks in India was um, not really hostile. It was not a hostile takeover, but still, uh, like a huge chunk of uh, I believe a huge chunk of its shares was was bought by Chinese um, People's Bank of China. So, 
isn't it more like giving control over to the chinese communist administration and not really private companies as such so can we consider this as an indirect governmental interference in trade in uh, asia uh, under the guise of free trade activities being carried out so that is my question um so it's a hard question to answer right yes would it be considered uh, governmental interference in trade i think there's uh, it's it's a reasonable uh, thought that it is and you want to be wary of uh, this kind of interference right but i think uh, the one thing we must be wary about is uh, to not let these kinds of bogeymen get in the way of genuine prospects for trade right so yes it's true uh, overall uh, china is likely to be a bad player yes it's true that overall china is likely to uh, you know sort of meddle and uh, take incorrect actions but you want to also think about what uh, what does it mean for the chinese person to be in poverty and what we can do to you know sort of encourage genuine liberalization efforts or genuine free trade efforts from china um and at the same time not assume that what china does or for i'm uh, i'm going to extend that what russia might do uh, is similar to all other firms and uh, sort of opportunities uh, and i think this becomes a very easy sort of cover uh to stop all trade in its tracks so instead of thinking about exceptions too much you want to think about uh, sort of what what our normal should look like and we can surely deal with exceptions so india for example i think has done something draconian but uh, with some sense that it has currently stopped all kinds of fdi from china um and it's of course we've always been looking for an excuse to do this so this gives us a really neat little um uh, a uh, manner to do this as well but you don't want to extend it to all countries saying oh look hostile takeover by government but perhaps there are other china experts in the group that might want to speak up um i think bhuvan i am if i may add another mm -hmm. please interesting thing from our study so the center for indonesian policy studies i think last year we published a report looking at exactly chinese investments well not necessarily chinese investments but we have a huge fintech industry going financial technology okay. in Indonesia and a lot of the investments a majority of the investments i should say comes from china okay. and you know there's a lot of concerns with these fintech industries um you see outrageous interest rates you see harassment in the way they're um getting the loans and everything so we looked at it and see if it's a problem with the chinese investments but the conclusion that we found was it's not necessarily the chinese investments but indonesia's regulatory framework that's not ready yeah. enough that's not ready yet to receive this investment so um all of these things will happen be it from chinese investments be it from us investments or any other investments but as long as your own country is not ready regulatory wise and policy wise to deal with um the investments and the trade um so that i think is what we should be worried about um i guess the point i'm trying to make is that the getting investments and receiving trade from china does not automatically mean that we're conceding to the authoritarian regime of the chinese government it's just we have to approach it as we want to mention we just have to approach it carefully um but not to close down anything from china is like automatically bad for us so we just have to treat it carefully and look at our policy responses so that we are aware of these risks and we're also mitigating these risks carefully sure yeah anita i think uh, sri lanka has seen a lot of china activity <laughs> maybe you want to pipe in as well um i'll keep my comments brief um i i broadly agree with what both of you said i think that um it it uh, you have to take these decisions with discretion and give it a lot of thought because we're not always necessarily in a position to put out a uh, say outright nope we're not it's just not going to happen um because there are um there are benefits that do come with it also a lot of problems and uh sort of uh the things factors that should be taken into consideration um but i think that 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 the final my the final point would be that in the case of china it it's simply act with caution um and think a bit before going into something but uh difficult situation not one where there is this is i don't think it's one where there is a straight forward yes or no um that is available there really is um, it is a situation 
Um, um, I think we're uh, inching towards the close of the session. So we have two options, either to take one more question or uh, comment from the group and then move to the, I think, the Discord uh, community. Um, does anybody want to type in with a question or a comment? And also feel free to unmic yourself and yeah. ask the question directly. Hi, this is Dave Schellenberg in Connecticut in the United States. You all did a great job. You're all well spoken. I wonder whether you have tried to advocate for what you probably uh, believe in to it unilateral free trade. And then secondly, do you ever take a moral approach as opposed to the economic approach, argue that protectionism is plunder and we have the natural right to trade with whom we please? And we, I know we've run out of time, but I want to at least uh, encourage you to think about those thoughts. David, that's a terrific, uh, both terrific uh, points. I think at least in the case of CCS, one of the things that we've uh, done is in the public policy conversations that we have, it's much harder to take the moral stance, uh, just more than anything else, because we seem to be losing our audience when we do that. That being said, we also run, uh, uh, you know, sort of student engagement programs. And we find that these arguments work beautifully there because then in 20 years when they are primed and ready, we've got, our policymakers to understand the morality of free trade or some of these. So that sort of worked really well for us, but you're right. I think it's time for us to um, speak louder uh, in public debate that, um, you know, sort of protectionism is plunder. Yeah, I think to jump onto that uh, from the Indonesian perspective, uh, we've been advocating for free trade for the last five years since chips has been established. Um, and you're, really right about putting up the moral argument although as a caveat the morality argument that we can approach might be different from the morality argument that you can make in the us versus what you can make in the indonesia because of just the cultural differences like when you talk about individual freedom that might not ring a bell to the broader public more so than if you because of the nature of indonesia and perhaps many asian countries where a very collective community collective nature and less of the individual freedom approach so what we're trying to do at chips is um, using that morality argument as to link that back to poverty and really how free trade is disadvantage uh, this um, really bringing lots of disadvantage to uh, poorer community lower income community that they're the ones who are uh, bearing the brunt of the protectionist element. So having that argument, um, as you said, will be, will add a lot more robust argument instead of the only just the economic argument. To, to very briefly sort of close, because I think we only have uh, over time now. I, Anita, why don't you close I, the, the session? Sure. I, I think that, uh, on the moral stance, I think Boana and Philippa have said it all. It is in, in the context of Asia, definitely in Sri Lanka, economic argument seems to be more effective um, than uh, uh, the moral argument, although it definitely has its value. Maybe we need to reconsider how we sort of package the moral argument um, using different language um, that would maybe con communicate the message better. Um, but yes, if uh, I'd like to wrap up today's uh, conversation. I think we can continue um, discussing this topic, asking questions, sharing experiences on the Discord app. And um, I see James asking everyone to join um, for the Asia Discord announcement, which happens at 1.20. Um, thank you so much uh, for having us here, Atlas. Um, I think it was a very enjoyable panel. Thank you so much, Buana and Philippa, for uh, giving us your time. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, James. Thanks see you later. Everyone. Great to see you all. Bye. Later. Take care. Take care. Thank you.